Well, hello, my name's Glenn Tweedy, and I've been asked by Pastor Dave to uh, re record a sermon that I preached at Cross Point Baptist Church in Clyde North uh, on the 23rd of October of 2022. So, uh, a sermon on how God guides us. But first, a Bible reading from 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 1 to 13. When David was told, Look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are looting the threshing floors. He inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord answered him, Go, attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, Here in Judah we are afraid. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the Philistine forces? Once again David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him, Go down to Keilah, for I'm going to give the Philistines into your hand. So David and his men went to Keilah, fought the Philistines, and carried off their livestock. He inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines and saved the people of Keilah. Now Abiathar, son of Ahimelech, had brought the ephod down with him when he fled to David at Keilah. And Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah, and he said, God has delivered him into my hands. For David has imprisoned himself by entering a town with gates and bars. And Saul called up all his forces for battle to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. When David learned that Saul was plotting against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod. And David said, Lord God of Israel, your servant has heard definitely that Saul plans to come to Keilah and destroy the town on account of me. Will the citizens of Keilah surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Lord God of Israel, tell your servant. And the Lord said, He will. Again David asked, Will the citizens of Keilah surrender me and my men to Saul? And the Lord said, They will. So David and his men, about 600 in number, left Keilah and kept moving from place to place. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he did not go there. I've read this passage because it uh, highlights how much guidance David sought from the Lord for what was a fairly major issue in his life. But I've noticed over nearly three decades of pastoral ministry, that uh, many Christians don't, don't really know sometimes whether it's a big issue or a small issue, how to know the guidance that God gives us. The, one of the most common questions I get asked as a pastor is, Pastor, what should I do? And uh, sometimes people will go, well, listen to the pastor. Sometimes I'll listen to friends, I'll listen to family, or they'll listen to someone on a tape or a video somewhere and uh, take that as guidance. Whereas the Bible says that it's God who wants to guide us. Isaiah 49 verse 10 says, They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. And it goes on. God wants to lead us if we will be led. Later on in Isaiah 58 verse 11, it says, The Lord will guide you continually. It goes on to, satisfy, to say, satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones and you'll be like a watered garden. God's heart is to be there for us and guide us. And while we may agree with, this, with the Bible and with the statements, it says, many find it hard to know God's guidance. Sometimes we miss it completely, get it completely wrong wonder if God's forgotten us because we don't seem to be getting an answer. wonder if God is just ignoring us. So today's topic is how God guides us. That, uh, that we're hopefully by understanding how he does it, it may help you in not just the big decisions of life, but also the small issues. But first I want you to know that God is ready, willing and able to help and to guide. Psalm 46 says it very clearly. He's a very present help in times of trouble. Very present means he's there waiting to help you. In the New Testament, we have the word Emmanuel used of Jesus. 
And uh, we know that word means God with us. But it's not just a word that applies to Jesus. It applies to the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. God has always wanted to be with us, with his people, with his creation. So he walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening in the garden. We find him walking with Enoch, with Noah, talking with Noah, talking with the patriarchs, um, visiting Abraham and, and uh, having a discussion about the Lot and Sodom and all of that. Part of that relationship that he wants to have with his people is to lead and to guide us, to bring counsel to us. Not as a domineering leader forcing us to do just what he wants, but as a, the friend who gives us wise counsel when we ask of him, when we seek wisdom. And so we read of, say, Moses. Whenever he needed, he had a tent of meeting and he could go into the tent of meeting and it says he talked of God as a, as a friend face to face. And from there he would receive counsel and guidance. We see that uh, in the promised land, God continually used the judges and the prophets uh, to bring guidance and direction to the tribes, to the people as they became a nation. And uh, later in the story of the kings, in the time of the kings, we saw how David continually asking of God. And as you read through David's whole story, you'll find that this is not just a one-off instance. This is just a continual uh, inquiring of God to seek God's guidance in all that he did. And when he followed that guidance, there were times when he didn't, but when he followed that guidance, he prospered. He prospered. And as we move from the Old Testament into New Testament times, God's intention is still the same. But let me stress that the means or the method of that guidance is different. We no longer have a physical place like a tabernacle, a tent of meeting or a temple that we have to go to. No longer do we need a prophet or a seer or a priest to act as an intermediary for us. No longer need a, an, an ephod or some other holy object to encounter and inquire of God through. For God has come to us and he's promised to be with us and that we may ask him anything. John 16 verse 17, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the, the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you, the helper. Psalm 46 again, a very present help in times of trouble. We now have a personal helper, one member of the Godhead. John 16 verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own. But whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. This helper now is not mute. Some people think of the Holy Spirit as just the power of God or the force of God. It's not. It is a person who speaks and who brings us wisdom and guidance from God himself. What he hears, he speaks. The difficulty we have is that the Holy, when the, with the Holy Spirit speaking is that he doesn't always speak to us in the way that we'd like. We'd like some fiery light uh, writing across the sky. We'd like a clear, big, loud voice in our ear. Uh, we'd like an angel coming down and grabbing us by the shoulder and, and like they did opening prison doors or talking to Mary. Gabriel came down. But it doesn't happen like that now. It's usually not that obvious. The Holy Spirit's voice is a small, still voice. And it's so easy to miss it. And if we miss it, then we can often focus instead on the other louder voices that are in our ears. And to make it even harder, sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks to us. God speaks to us and doesn't even use words. If you're married as I am, then you know sometimes you might be out at a function with your wife and she doesn't need words just to give you a look or a nudge or a, just to say it's time to go or can we get out now? It's just you, so much is said with just that nonverbal communication. So how does God guide us these days? 
Let me share what I've figured out works for me and with the checks and balances to make sure I get it right and to hear correctly. And I've tried to find a way to make it memorable and something that you can refer back to all the time. And so I'd ask you just to maybe hold up your left hand. Hold it up so it's facing you with your thumb going away in this direction. And uh, I want you, back in the days when we used to bring pens and notebooks to church, this was a lot easier. But if you've got a pen with you, maybe write on your fingertips. A, B, C, D and E. A, B, C, D and E. And I'm using the left hand because it's uh, in the biblical terms, we call it the left hand of comfort, whereas the right hand is God's right hand of power. And the comfort we have when we know God is guiding us is so good. It is a great comfort. So left hand, A, B, C, D and E. And I'm going to start with E, the little finger. The little finger has been lots of places. It's an explorer. It's always having different little experiences. If you want to find out if uh, uh, the water is hot, you'll just dip your little finger in it a little bit and make sure it's okay. It, it's the finger that goes into your ear if you've got an itch. The little finger goes all sorts of strange places. If you come across something that says wet paint, you can't resist yourself, can you? You've just got to reach out and we use the little finger just to touch it and see if it is wet or if it has dried. And I've even known some people who've used the little finger to put up their nose, their nasal cavity. And the letter E that we've put on our little finger stands for all of those experiences that we've had in life. This little finger has had lots of different experiences. It's been a lot of places. A lot of things have happened around it. And God uses all of your experiences to prepare you for his purposes in life. Now, even the worst of our experiences, God uses those. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 14 says, In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider, surely God has appointed the one as well as the other. You know, God has allowed some of us to have awful experiences. But they are there to allow God to work in our lives and then through our lives for other purposes. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 4, Paul is encouraging the Corinthian church and he's talking about the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Whenever you see a word repeated multiple times like that, that is the key word. Five times we see this idea of a negative experience, a tribulation, being used by God to a comfort us and to comfort others. Your experiences are very useful for God to guide you. The second finger we come to now is the ring finger. The finger that normally has a ring on it and uh, can have an engagement ring, can have a wedding ring, an eternity ring. And it's a ring that indicates relationship. And we've numbered it, uh, lettered it number D, letter D, for discussion. And I would encourage you when you're seeking guidance, don't just listen to what someone on TV says. Don't just listen to what a stranger says. Find someone that you are in relationship with and that you trust and seek out godly people, ministers, godly neighbours, godly friends who can give you wise counsel. It's okay to get godly counsel from people. There's great benefit in seeking out that sort of counsel. Although God is our number one wise counsellor, as it says in Isaiah, he also uses others. Proverbs 27 verse 9 says, The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. There is much wisdom to be gained from seeking counsel from people that you are in relationship with, people who love you, people who care for you, people who want to see the best for you. 
but we need to be careful what we listen to because this, this finger is not as flexible as some of the others. This finger tends to follow. If I try and lower my third finger down, my middle finger down, this one wants to follow. If I try and lower my other one down, it, it's following other voices. So be careful because godly discussion is good, but we can be caught up in just following what others are doing. We come to the middle finger. The middle finger is usually the biggest finger on our hand. It's, it's a, and often the biggest means that God uses to get through to us. We have the letter C on it. And C is for the, one of the biggest influences in our lives that God uses to guide us. It's circumstances. C for circumstances. We, we see in this, the Bible, Joseph went through some terrible circumstances, enslavement, imprisonment, and uh, God used all of those circumstances to, to move him and to get him to the place that he needed to be so he could use him for the people of, the, of, uh, of Israel. God uses it, uh, circumstances to open doors, to close doors, and most of us respond to those circumstances in our life more than we would do to, say, listening to the Holy Spirit or to the Bible or anything else. And that's okay because God does use our circumstances. Uh, I'm originally from Hobart and um, we had a stirring. My wife and I and family had a stirring about coming to the mainland and uh, the circumstances opened up from a casual conversation and everything that fell into place and gave us a clear guidance that we were to, to relocate. Uh, and we've been in Melbourne now for nigh on 30 years. That's how God uses circumstances. The next finger that we're going to look at is our index finger. It's the pointer finger. It's the finger that we use to point to things, to specific things. And we've got the letter B on there, which is for Bible. The Bible. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, The word is a lamp to my feet, the light to my path. And as, and as we come to the Bible, it often doesn't give specific guidance about specific issues in our life. Should I marry Pam or Mary? Should I go here or should I go there? Sometimes the Bible doesn't. We can't open the Bible and go, Thou shalt marry Pam. It doesn't tell us that. But what it does do, it points us to the principles of truth, integrity, righteousness, and others that determine how we should live the Christian life. Not sure who to marry between Pam and Mary? The Bible says don't be unequally yoked. It, uh, if, you, if there's a choice between a, a Christian and a non-Christian, favour the Christian. Someone who's got equal standing with you. It's the pointer, the Bible. Now I want to bring a little check and balance to this, a bit of a caution, because these four alone are not do not guarantee God's good guidance because just the four of them on their own make it very difficult to pick things up. Now, I can pick up my Bible and hold it as best I can. I can try and pick up my glasses. But if it's a hot cup of tea, uh, it's going to be very difficult to hold it just using those four fingers. I've seen my people make mistakes because they've, they've maybe got a word through or an, a, a feeling of guidance through circumstances and experiences and then they've rushed off to do something uh, without getting it confirmed, without any sort of other validity given to it. And uh, I've seen these people get off track. I've seen other people, you know, say, take a word from the Bible and uh, and then talk it over with some godly people. And they go, yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. And off they go. And they can end up realising later down the track that they've made a bad decision. And this is where the thumb comes in. The one that we have labelled A. The thumb on for us when we're picking something up and f holding on to something firm, it is our opposable thumb. It makes it so much easier to hold that hot cup of tea and get it to your mouth without spilling it down your shirt. It's, uh, it, it's for writing, for gripping, for hitchhiking, whatever you want to do, you need that thumb. 
And uh, the letter A that we've written on it is for the anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, as we spoke about before, whether it's an audible or an inner voice, whether it's through visions and dreams, whether it's through visitations, whether it's through the use of gifts, the Holy Spirit will confirm the guidance to us. In the story we read about David, he didn't just take the Lord's first answer. He would come back and he would check. He would confirm it. So what about the people of Keilah? Will they surrender me? They will. You know, he was constantly confirming and making sure that what he'd got received the first time was correct. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. We can combine it with circumstances and we can hold anything with those two fingers. We can combine it with a relationship and we can hold anything with those two fingers. I'm holding my glasses like right now. Uh, we, so in combination with the others, the Holy Spirit brings us that, comp, uh, that confirmation. And the Holy Spirit is the most important means that God uses to communicate his guidance to us. Now, God's ways and God's thoughts, as Isaiah 55 tells us, are higher than ours. We can't know his ways and his thoughts. But through the Holy Spirit, his ways are made known to us. It's not a paradox. The Bible talks about it, and Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. He says, No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, he says, so we can know the wonderful things that God has freely given us. We can't know God's thoughts for us in our life. Only God's spirit can know that. But we've received God's spirit so that what he, he will make known to us what God has freely given us and also the guidance that God has. Again, there is a danger that some people only respond to the Holy Spirit. They only respond to the A, the anointing. And they go off at 100 kilometres an hour and they... As an observer, I've watched them get into some awful trouble over the years because they've thought God was leading them by that and uh, they haven't sought confirmation. They haven't uh, tested the guidance they thought they received. And one other final illustration. I'd ask you if you're watching this just to hold up one finger of that left hand. Right. Now hold up four fingers of that left hand. There we go. What controls your hand? Your mind did that. I asked you and your mind went, I will put up one finger. I could put, you could have put up any finger you decided to. But your mind, we've got to be careful because sometimes our mind can seek to control the will of God for us. It can seduce us into thinking that our desires are actually God's desires for us. And we start interpreting the A, B, C, D and E in such a way as to justify our own desires. I've heard people justify their actions many times. And I know that they're not right. They're not biblical in some cases, but they are justifying them because of what their mind is telling them. Their own desires, their own passions and in some cases, their own lusts. So I just encourage you, as you're watching this video, you've always got your left hand with you. Always think of it as A, B, C, D, and E. And don't just take God's guidance from one finger or the other, but make it as many, uh, many harmonious fingers as you can, working together, anointing, Bible, circumstances discussion and your past experiences will all feed into that as well but it is the littlest of them i'm going to leave you just with one scripture and encourage you to think about guidance god's guidance he loves to give wise counsel he is our counselor and he doesn't force his will upon you he has given you the gift of free will but he wants you to seek his guidance. Ephesians 5 verse 17 from the New Living Translation says, Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't act 
thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Think about your left hand and the different ways God guides us. In the, in doesn't, for big decisions, for small decisions, it's, God is there for all guidance that you need. Father God, I thank you that you are the God who leads us. You are the God who guides us continually. I thank you, Lord, that you're not uh, silent or mute over us, but your Holy Spirit will share your thoughts, your heart for each one of us. May we know your guidance in every decision that we seek your counsel for. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you very much for listening to me. God bless you.